Thanks. I want to say thank you to the organizers for inviting me to talk about the mass, massive black hole seeds, or the seeds that come actually from population three stars. And in this talk, I'll review I mean, the past work that's been done in the past decade on the journey of a black hole that forms from a pop three star and its journey on how much it accretes and how it actually how it actually flows through the ISM and IGM and ending up in these early dwarf galaxies. And this is work that's been done with my collaborators, Tom Abel, Marcelo Alvarez, Michael Norman, my, one of my grad students, Chao Shi, Matt Turk, and Hao Zhu. So I, I want to give a brief overline on, on what is the journey of these stellar mass black holes. So first, because it all depends on what are the characteristics of these metal-free stars, I want to spend some time on some of the, the latest uh, results from POP3 star formation simulations. And then I'll go into the details on what actually happens onto the accretion onto a single black hole seed. And we'll be looking at how important is the rate of feedback on, on how it affects the inflows and outflows around these black holes. And how much gas does the, do these uh, small seeds actually accrete in these mini halos? So mini halos meaning any halos below a virial temperature of 10 to the 4 Kelvin, around 10 to the 8 solar masses or so at these times. And then my last half of the talk, I'll be talking about where these seeds actually end up in, in the first galaxies. I mean, how are they distributed in these first galaxies? Do we have a central black hole or not? Or are they, or are they dispersed through the ISM? And I'll, I'll end with how many of these uh, seeds do we actually expect in the first galaxies? So I want to start on just some, some chemistry basics on how, why do these pop three stars form and why are they massive? So in the early universe, we only have hydrogen and helium and some some lithium, and so because we have no, no metals, we have no dust, and so metal-free star formation, it primarily relies on H2 formation. So you have this, this set of reactions where you can form H2 in the gas phase and not on dust grains, and, but this process is, I mean, H2 is a very delicate molecule where it can be dissociated by Lyman-Werner radiation, which Jared was talking about before, but this is an optically thin, so you know, you can have this UVB, UV background that can dissociate H2. And this actually regulates on where these first stars actually form. How big are the halo? How big does a halo have to actually be if you're giving some UV background? So this is some work that's been done by, I mean, one in many that have looked at this. Uh, Brian O'Shea and Michael Norman, they looked at, at what halo mass do you actually form one of these pop three stars given a radiation background. And you can see that it varies if you have almost no uh, ultraviolet background. They usually form in something like five to 500,000 solar masses. But if you have some more typical ultraviolet background, they form, typically form in, in halos around 10 to the 7. So it really depends on your local lyman werner uh, radiation intensity on what kind of host halos these form in. And just to give, put this graph into some visual terms, we can actually look at how these halos look. So this top graph, we show uh, density projections and temperature projections. And th this is with no radiation feedback. This is with some uh, Lyman Warner uh, background. This is uh, around 10 to the minus 22 uh, of J. So you can see this, this halo is around 10 to the 6, a million solar masses. And if you increase the Lyman Warner uh, background by another order of magnitude, you just get you need larger and larger halos to actually support H2 cooling so you can form an, uh, a population three star. And it just goes on. I mean, the, more, the higher, uh, higher amount of feedback you have in the, in the soft UV background, the more massive of a halo that you actually need to form a pop three star. And because uh, we don't have any metals, and it's not like present day star formation, where we're we're reliant on molecular hydrogen. So this is a graph that I took from Omakai's paper in 2010. These just show in one's own models, how is the equation of state actually behaving? So this red line shows how the, how the density, how the temperature behaves as a function of density. So I can see you adiabatically heat, then cooling becomes important, and you pretty much bottom out at 300 Kelvin. And this dip right here sets the genes mass on which fragmentation actually occurs. This, this sets the genes mass of the central uh, molecular core. And this is around 1,000 solar masses. You can see once you start increasing the metallicity, you can start cooling down and down, all the way down to 3 Kelvin, which we see almost see. I mean, you can see down to 10 Kelvin in, in the Milky Way. 
So originally, uh, POP3 stars were, were thought to be forming in isolation one per halo. But lately, in the past five years, people have been finding that you find fragmentation on a much smaller scale than the 1,000 solar masses. You find fragmentation of, of cores around tens of solar masses. And I want to show one example from Matt Turk. So this field of view is 200 AU. It's a cosmological simulation that they focus on the collapse of one of these uh, H2 coolers. And they actually saw fragmentation in the collapse. So they have two cores that will not merge before they actually reach main sequence. You have one core with six solar masses and another at 10 solar masses. And they're still rapidly accreting. And this just points toward you may have binary and multiple systems in these uh, metal-free halos. And it's still it's accreting at almost a tenth of a solar mass per year. So, but all of these simulations, all of these POP3 star simulations, I mean, one big thing they're after is what is the IMF of POP3 stars. And it's really important to pin down the IMF to actually look at what their, uh, what their effects are on the first galaxies. Because it really depends on what the, what the endpoints of these first stars are. So here's a plot from Alice Hagar. So just this is a fun, the stellar endpoints as a function of initial mass of the star versus metallicity. So we're at metal free, so focus at the low y values. So here we have your typical type 2 supernova. And in between 40 and 140 solar masses, you have some direct collapse into a black hole. And above this, between 140 and 260 solar masses, you have a parent stability supernova that only occurs in metal free stars. And above this, you have, again, direct collapse in the black hole. So it's really important that this, these works pin down the IMF of the POP3 stars, because we want to know what fraction of these stars form supernova that actually enrich the IGM and, and continue to it'll be re-accreted into these halos to form the first galaxies. And also, what this talk is going to be focusing on is the black hole seeds from these POP3 stars. So there, but there is a problem with, with actually feeding these stellar mass black holes. It's a matter of the radiation feedback from the main sequence of these POP3 stars, because they're thought to be very massive. And tens of solar masses is their characteristic mass. So this is some work that we've done six years ago now. Just a single, uh, well, a single halo that forms two POP3 stars. And this is a million solar mass, uh, million solar mass dark matter halo. And it, we simulate a uh, 100 solar mass star, which was the, in vogue at the time. So these massive stars, but no supernova at all. All you'll see is what happens from radiation feedback. So you can see the H region grows, breaks out of the halo, but it drives a 30 kilometer per second shock, which is tremendous compared to the, the escape velocity of these mini halos. The escape velocity of these mini halos is three kilometers per second. So it just drives out all this gas from the halo, and you're left with a gas poor halo. And you can just imagine, this is a very harsh environment for the black hole to actually grow. You're in a warm and diffuse environment with not much gas to accrete. So this is, sets the stage on the very first epochs of black hole accretion, in which I'll spend the, ne the next third of my talk on this. On, so I'll be going over some of our work that we did a few years ago and, and others that have looked at the same topic. So we looked at a similar uh, similar situation, similar scenario, where we f simulated one POP3 star and followed the accretion on, onto it. So we first looked at uh, POP3 star forming in a, in a mini halo that, that was around 500,000 solar masses. And we followed the mass accretion onto the black hole for 200 million years. We had initial mass of the black hole for uh, the initial black hole mass of 100 solar masses. And we assumed bondi hoyle accretion. And the simulation had a resolution of a tenth of a parsec at this redshift. So we resolved the Bondi radius. And I'll show you this movie that let's zoom it out. So this is with no feedback. And this is with feedback. Uh, Priya showed a little preview of this, uh, this uh, simulation. But what you see in the corner is just another star going off out of the field of view. But what to actually look at is if you see these insets how diffuse this gas is when you compare with no feedback at all. So I can actually pause this and bring it to the very end. So you can see that with no feedback, you can really accumulate gas in the center near the black hole as it orbits around and falls to the center. But with feedback from, from the, the rated feedback that the, the, the x-ray feedback that the black hole actually gives, 
heats, you can see this, this cold clump exists with no feedback, but with feedback, this is all heated up and puffed out just because of pressure forces. So if we look at the accretion rate, so for this black hole, Eddington is 10 to the 6 solar masses. So even without any radiation feedback, epsilon of 0, you can see as this clump orbits around and passes by this black hole, you get these spikes of accretion. And, but you're still orders of magnitude. Well, this is around a, a tenth of Eddington. You're still below Eddington accretion, but because we're considering the Bondi uh, accretion rate. But if we only include some tiny amount of feedback, 10 to the minus 3 uh, radiation efficiency, you start lowering the accretion by orders of magnitude, especially as you puff out that cloud and, and decrease the amount of uh, cold gas available for accretion. And this just goes on, decreasing, decreasing, as we pump up the radiation efficiency of this, uh, of this black hole. And what do we actually, why is this decreasing? So what we show here is the evolution of where the black hole is in this uh, in density and temperature space, and which regulates what is the Bondi accretion rate. So this is the main sequence of the star, denoted by the star symbols. And with feedback is blue. So you can see a locus of points is surrounded, is right around a millionth of the Eddington ratio. And without feedback, it's around 10 to the minus 2 of Eddington. So, it's for, so in these mini halos, you effectively decrease the accretion rates by a factor of, of 100 to 10,000. But there's a big caveat of this study. We only followed this, this, uh, this black hole evolution until uh, the, over 200 million years, but it was in a halo that didn't have a very rapid accretion uh, history. We only followed it up to 5 million solar masses. So it's still a small halo. We couldn't really make any connections with, uh, with the M-sigma relationship and, and otherwise. But I mean, we're always saying that is rapid accretion, uh, is rapid accretion possible in more massive halos? So this is work done in UT Austin by Jean et al. And they actually followed a similar uh, simulation that we presented and up to 10 to the 8 solar masses. And what they found is here's the accretion rate without feedback. So this dashed line is Eddington. So without feedback, they find that it, it follows the Eddington ratio. But when they include this, this radiation feedback, you actually decrease this by was this, uh, 100 to 1,000 times. And it just and this just happens because it's heated. It's, you have, you're, you're placed in a more diffuse and warm environment. And here is the actual growth of the black hole. Without feedback, you have growth by, or, by a factor of 100. But with feedback, you just relatively heat and, and uh, just puff out this gas. So you can't really efficiently accrete. And also, I want to point out Kwang uh, Ho Park's work and his thesis. And I, he'll, he may be talking about this later in the week. On, because these simulations, they, they assume the Bondi uh, accretion rate. But is that really true? Because our, I mean, we don't have the ability to actually have the resolution to go below the Bondi rate. But they studied uh, the accretion flows within the Bondi rate. And what they found was there are two modes of accretion. If you're above some critical density, you can have this very rapid duty cycle of around 50%. And this is just caused by the ionization front created by the by the rate of feedback going out. And once you blow out all the gas, you remove this luminosity, and the ionization front collapses, and this gas falls back in, causing this rapid, uh, <clears throat> rapid duty cycle. But without that, you get this slow duty cycle of around 6%. But hopefully, he'll talk about that more in detail later in the week. So, this, uh, so now I want to switch gears to more massive halos and how how these black holes actually congregate in the first galaxies. So I'll be presenting uh, results from two simulations. The first one is a small scale simulation. It is a, so it's a one and a half megaparsec box, has a dark matter resolution of 100 solar masses. And we have a spatial resolution of one co-moving one co-moving parsec. So in this simulation, we include pop three, two and three star formation. And we randomly sat, sample from, a, from an IMF that has a characteristic mass of 40 solar masses. And just, just sets what kind of stellar endpoints we have. So we have a good mix of metals and, and black hole seeds. So here we show uh, density and temperature and the black dots are the black holes. So you can see you get multiple black holes in these galaxies. 
And they're just preheating the IgM. Their H2 regions grow and grow, and they eventually heat up the surrounding regions. But if we look, take a closer look at this, let me let this play through again. Okay, if we look at this in more detail, just a zoom in of this, this uh, 10 to the 8 solar mass halo at redshift 11. Here you can see it's because the accretion onto the black holes, I mean, in this case, in this galaxy, they're kind of just orbiting around in the ISM. This is a, so this galaxy doesn't really have a, a central black hole just because the most massive progenitor actually had a supernova. One of these, uh, it might have been a, a pair instability. I, I have to double check on that. And so we didn't have a, a black hole remnant. And this is why this galaxy doesn't have a central black hole. And most of this radiation right here, or this, this high temperature region is, is being created by, by stellar radiation just escaping into the IGM and contributing to renization. So, so how do these black holes actually accrete? These, I, I plot the accretion rates onto the, the five most massive, or the five, uh, the black holes with the five highest accretion rates, mean accretion rates. So you can see you have a very small duty cycle, which uh, Quang Ho showed in his paper, but you, you can see you have uh, some different scales. And this is just as gas, as they, as they orbit around in the galaxy, they inter encounter different uh, density blobs. And, and also, because they're orbiting around, their relative velocities with the gas is actually is pretty high, and this actually regulates how much accretion this actually actually makes it onto the black hole. So why, what actually causes all this, this rapid duty cycle? And, and it, another thing to point out, the Eddington rate is, is still 10 to the 6. So, you, so we're still finding the same things as we found in the, our previous study. So I made this movie plotting how the black hole actually travels through density and temperature space. So it's, it's colored by time. You can see it loiters around here as it heats up the gas. And then it encounters some uh, supernova blast wave. And here it just it travels around. But most of the time, it ends up it is, is heating up the surrounding regions just because of uh, x-ray, from the x-rays that it actually creates. See, it, it produces some H2 region that's around a million solar masses, but it's still not that dense. Then it encounters some other dense blob, and, and its radiation feedback brings it back down. It puffs up the gas. So overall, this, you can see it spends most of the time in this region. And if you recall from before, this is, in this region, it's, uh, it's around 10 to the minus 4 of uh, the Eddington accretion rate. And the second simulation that I want to focus on is actually a much bigger simulation. We, internally, we call this the rare peak simulation. And we followed. It's a simulation that's uh, 40 co-moving megaparsecs, and we follow it until Recha 15. That's just how long we've actually run it to. And we're able to, our dark matter sim, our resolution is 34,000 solar masses. So that means we're able to resolve uh, basically 10 to the 6 solar mass dark matter halos. So this has the same physics and, and uh, prescriptions for star formation and feedback as a previous simulation, but we haven't included any feedback from the black holes or any accretion up there. So just a, a few stats about the simulation. We have uh, 3 billion solar mass dark matter halos, over 13,000 pop 3 stars, and 3,000 galaxies. So here's a little journey through the, the simulation where we are zooming in to, into, the, into the high resolution region. So you can see all these H2 regions that are created by, by these galaxies here. So they're they're actively forming stars, and we follow the POP3 stars, and it's transitioned to POP2 stars and galaxy formation. So we're going up here to a more dense region. So this is just packed with galaxies, with little tiny dwarf galaxies. So I can see here's some biased region that's heated the surrounding IGM. And you can just imagine 3, 13,000 POP3 stars, and we have good statistics to actually look at how many remnants are in each dwarf galaxy. So it's almost finished. And you can just see there's all sorts of interesting things going on. You can see blast waves here and anything. It's such a huge data set, and we've just begun to explore this. And the first paper that we put out was actually the statistics on, on how many POP3 remnants are in, in these dwarf galaxies. So just uh, I, I think I have time to just, just say something about the POP3 star formation rate. So this is actually showing. The POP3 star formation right here is the scale over here. So we're forming 
in this biased region, um, uh, 10 to the minus 6 stars per co-moving megaparsec cubed. And so that translates to, I mean, given our IMF, we didn't want to, we wanted to give these numbers uh, separate from the IMF that we actually, uh, that we actually assumed and, and, and put it into some number, some number rate, some number density. So our star formation rate, actually, you can see it levels off here at around 10 to the minus 4 solar masses per year per megaparsec cubed. And why does this happen? It's not because the halos were being enriched by, say, pop three stars that were going off before, or some nearby blast wave that overpassed another halo. It's actually suppressed by lyman werner feedback. So because you're in such a biased region, and this is, is where we may expect uh, you know, the direct collapse black holes that uh, Jared mentioned and, and Priya mentioned, is, is because they, they experience such a high level of lyman werner feedback is they suppress all the low mass uh, halos from forming pop three stars. So you can just imagine the critical mass to form a pop three star is just increasing, increasing, increasing. And this would just drive the star, form star formation rates to, to level out. So one, one thing that I want to focus on is the fraction of halos that actually host, have hosted a pop three star. So we can focus on the, the Z of 15 plot or section here. These, the red bars actually give you the fraction of halos that have hosted a pop three star. So I can see that because we're in such a biased region, that you suppress all star formation, all pop three star formation, basically below 10 to the seven solar masses, just because of the strong lyman werner feedback. And, and in between, because of hierarchical merging, in between 10 to the seven, 10 to the eight solar masses, on average, these halos host around 10 pop three star. Uh, pop three remnants, and we want to separate. We just said, I mean, how many remnants were in in the halos? Because it all depends. I mean, the number of black holes that we have in the galaxy all depends on the IMF. What fraction actually forms black holes? So from this, we can actually we can get some understanding of how many of these black holes we expect in, in dwarf galaxies. And the most massive halos that we can track at redshift 15, they have on average 50 remnants, and in their halo. But something to, interesting that, that we found, we have to look into this more closely. If you look at here, there are several halos that haven't hosted a pop three star above three times 10 to the seven. So that, at this rush, if these are the atomic coolers that are great candidates for the direct collapse scenario. So we need to look into more closely. This is basically the first paper of a, a survey paper that we just looked at statistics, but that should be future work upcoming in the next year. And also, if you remember when I was going over the characteristics of the first stars, we're finding that, that they can form binaries and multiple systems. So if we have some massive star binary, this would lead toward X-ray bi binaries in the next, or X-ray binaries after one star dies. So what we looked at was what, how many halos had pop three stars and when did they form? So basically, if you look at one column in here, if you look at 10 to the 7 solar mass halos, you can see most of the halos have formed stars, pop three stars, around 30 million years ago. So depending on the model that you pick of how long uh, high mass X-ray binaries actually live, we can get some sense of where the X-ray binaries actually live, what kind of halos. So you can see, and given your choice of the lifetime 10 or 20 or 30 million years, most of them will live in these these uh, halos in between 10 to the 7 and 10 to the 8 solar masses. And it's important to actually consider this, I mean, the effects of X-ray binaries during reionization, and several groups are starting to look at this in, in detail, is because their X-rays, I mean, their X-rays have a long free mean path, and they can partially ionize the IGM, additionally raising the Thomson, optical, uh, Thomson uh, scattering optical depth tau. To, to be more in line with what Planck and WMAP have observed. So I think, I mean, that's all I've wanted to present on most recent work, but I want to spend the last few minutes on some, some questions I would like to pose. Jared actually uh, had a little pre preview of this in his Q&A session is, so I think there's some connection in between what this field is going through and what pop, the pop three star formation simulations are going through is, 
are we just not simulating these systems far enough to actually see fragmentation? Because we might form some central black hole, but what actually forms after that? What kind of galaxy actually forms around this black hole? Because if you make the analogy with POP3 stars, in 2007 and, and before, people didn't find fragmentation. They went all the way down to the protostellar shock. This is, a, this is work by Naoki Yoshida in 2007. This is a cosmological, cosmological simulation that actually went down to 25 solar radii. And they didn't see any fragmentation. But just a matter of just studying the, the collapse to farther and farther in its evolution. And this is work by Thomas Greif et al. Looking at the fragmentation, the disk fragmentation around metal-free collapses. So you can see in this, I mean, these, these laps around 10 years in real time. And this is very expensive simulation. This is why they only could last this long. But they do indeed see fragmentation. So would we see the same type of behavior in, in, in uh, the direct collapse scenarios? And also some other questions to, to actually think about. I mean, you just, in the direct collapse uh, scenario, we have some, some warm, massive blob of gas, 10 to the 5 solar mass of gas within one parsec. Does all of that actually go into some quasi-star massive, supermassive black hole or black hole? And so how much of that gas actually goes into the black hole? How much goes into stars? Once these form, how does the outflows actually affect the inflows? So in, and that I just led into that point. Once they actually form, can you just decrease the uh, accretion rates? If the black hole is actually forms, does it suppress star formation or trigger star formation? It's totally up in the air, I think. And also, you could also think about you have some pre-existing black hole that formed from a POP3 star that's actually embedded in a pristine gas cloud, these, these uh, direct collapse uh, scenarios. And, and you're just dumping all of this gas in there. That's, that's the biggest problem. It's not actually how to form the black hole, but how to actually get all of that gas into the central parsec. And what would happen if we had a black hole already in the center? Would it still form, would it form a quasi-star, or would it, would it just dump onto the black hole, or would it, how many stars would it form? Just some questions I wanted to put out there. But that ends my, my talk. And in summary, I want to put out, I just want to, you should take away that the rate of feedback is very important in these mini halos because they heat and rarefy the local environment. But on the larger scale, they don't have much effects on the IGM. And, and dynamically, they don't have any large effects. And their, their accretion rates are tiny. I mean, they're orders of magnitude below end. And, and also, they're limited only in mini halos. And we're seeing signs that you can get more growth in more massive halos. And also, my last third of the talk, I. I stated that we are finding tens of black hole seeds from, from POP3 stars, but they're orbiting around the galaxy, weakly decaying by dynamical friction. But still, in this phase, they're weakly accreting. And so that's why I want you to take away from this talk that I've given you, and thank you for your attention. So questions, Martha. <laughs> Okay. Since now you are finally forming low mass stars in these simulations, uh -huh. uh, can you also start exploring the stellar dynamical path to black hole formation? Oh, I see what you're saying. Right. So you have these massive, like, just really dense star stellar clusters, well, right? Mergers of stars or black holes, as I think uh, Melvin uh, will talk about. I don't about. think we can actually get to that point yet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, we could form a cluster of pop three stars. But that's still on these mini halos. I think to get to that, we would need some some additional machinery, like the computational machinery, to actually look at the. I don't know if you need relativistic effects or not. Right? Yeah, you shouldn't. But to get that resolution, to get stellar mergers, I think that would be quite hard. Okay. So. When modeling the radiative feedback, what do you assume about spectral energy distribution? Coming from so we assume a multicolor, uh, multicolor disk. Uh, I mean the the black body from that, and a high energy power law. And so we consider, in in the simulation that I showed from 2008, 2009, we considered just the mean energy. So this is the first step in doing this. And what would that mean energy typically be? The the mean energy was around uh, 0.5 keV. So. I mean, the, the correct thing to do now that we have the ability to do this to actually consider the full spectrum 
And so we have some lookup tables depending on the column density, how much would be ionized and, and heated. So this is a commonly used uh, algorithm in radiation transport. Thank you. Yeah, so you showed the uh, like first point that what we see is they're essentially you're saying that the radiative feedback makes the accretion process very inefficient. Right. So if you just extrapolate this to say the massive seeds that Jack mm -hmm. spoke about, uh, what what kind of feeling do you have will happen in that case? Will the larger black hole mass impose an even higher radiative feedback uh, depending on the accretion rate, or would it not matter because the black hole would start off so massive that you know it, it could just you have a deeper potential well, it would have to you would need more energy to actually blow off the gas. But yeah. I think one thing that's missing from all these simulations is a model for a, a cold reservoir, just a disk, right? Like as you, you assume that it's the black hole is embedded in some cell or some smoothing kernel. And if you have some cold reservoir gas, I think this some work has been done on this by Chris Power and his collaborators, where you can actually keep a, cord, uh, a disk, I mean, in the simulation, have some subgrid model of an AGN. But I think, uh, and plus, you would, let's see, also in these more massive galaxies, you would have to fight against radiative feedback and supernova feedback from stars as well. So, yeah, it's kind of hard to, to imagine what would happen. I just have a comment sure. um, following also Mar Marta's question um, about the comparison between the Yoshida et al. result and the more uh -huh. recent Griff et al. result. I think it's definitely too early to say that we can form Loma stars. I mean, what, what they can uh, demonstrate actually is that you can have um, 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 even vigorous fragmentation at the very latest uh, phases of the collapse, but I can follow the fate of these fragments for only 10 years. Right. This is, you know, yeah, far most too short to say that you actually can form a Loma stars. It may turn out that this is simply a, uh, let's say, clumpy accretion mode. Yeah, it's a uh, clumpy accretion model. I mean, I think most of those clumps would merge back in into the central star, and, and the central protostar. I think, I'm trying to remember, but I think they had one or two low mass stars being ejected, yes. but you know that's a special case. It, it is hard to say that yeah, this yeah. is a predominantly low mass star right. formation. There was an interesting paper lately by Hajime Susa. You probably have you seen? Yeah, where they actually—I mean, it was, a, it was an idealized simulation where they looked at the collapse of many halo, and looked at—they considered radiation feedback and looked at the multiplicity of the the pop three stars. They did find massive stars forming, but the, the lowest mass star that they found was four, three or four solar masses. So still, it wouldn't be around today. Yeah, it, it was really interesting to see like 10 or around about that uh, uh -huh. black holes in the uh, same halo. So right. I wonder what is the time, I mean, at what separation they are, and um, what if uh, uh, they, they merge with each other, then um, Mm, they so. would also add into the mass. So, I mean, for example, 10, 100 mass black hole, you have already 10 to 3 or so. So, I think when they're orbiting around in the galaxy, they're not going to merge with other uh, black holes that are having the same orbits, but they're just going to spiral in by dy dynamical friction and merge with the central black hole. So, what is the time? Uh, did you estimate? I mean, would it be reasonable? Uh, we time we haven't really looked at that, but I think it's, it's around like. 100 million years or so. I mean, I'm trying to think of the order of magnitude. It's been a while mm -hmm. since I estimated that. Right. Other questions? Well, if not, thanks again. Thanks.